follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, as any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Our second reading for this morning is from the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, verse 30, through chapter 19, verses 1 to 4. Keep my requirements and do not follow any of the detestable customs that were practiced before you came and do not defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord your God. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Each of you must respect your mother and father and you must observe my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make metal gods for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. We have Brother Sergi will minister God's word to us. Good morning, brothers and sisters, friends, guests. My name is Sergey. I'd like to start with a story. President Calvin Coolidge, uh, for those of you who, like me, didn't know about him, a 30th president of USA during 1923, 1929, 100 years ago. So he invited some people from his hometown to dinner uh, at the White House. Since uh, they didn't know how to behave at such an occasion, so they thought the best policy would be just to do what the president did. So the time came for serving coffee. The president poured some coffee into a saucer. As soon as the home folk saw it, they did the same. The next step for the president was to pour some milk and add a little sugar to the coffee in the saucer. The home folks did the same. They thought for sure that the next step would be for the president to take the saucer with the coffee and begin sipping it. But the president didn't do so. He leaned over, placed the saucer on the floor, and called the cat. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? I just tried to imagine the faces of people when they saw the cat. Imitating someone, we can find ourselves in unexpected situations. However, the process of imitation is observation model of learning is a natural part of our lives. And knowing this, because God himself created this, God invites us today to reflect on what is it the Bible says about imitating him. I'd like to remind that we continue our series on Ephesians, which we started in June. Two weeks ago, Pastor Moses preached on walking worthily in the Lord, reflecting Christ. Last we then continued the theme of walking worthily, approaching, approaching the topic as Apostle John would do it, just in black and white colors. Disciple of Christ, Christ should live by spirit in the physical world. Otherwise, if a disciple of Christ lives by the standards of physical world in the church, then the con consequences would not be really good. What can I say? Today we'll hear the third sermon on the same topic, walking in the Lord. Third sermon in a row. I, I might feel start like irritating, like preachers, don't you have other topics to preach about? I suppose that that was Apostle Paul's intention. Get the point into the minds and hearts of Ephesians. 
First time, a person may have passed information between the ears. Second time, some of the information attracted attention. Third time, the teaching makes its way through to the heart. So that's my hope for today. As we have read the passage from Ephesians and the parallel passage from the Old Testament, I'd like to urge us today, imitate God of love. Don't imitate love. So let's first talk about imitation of God of love. Pardon my English, but later you'll see the reason for such clumsy language. Let's read, read the verses 1 and 2 again. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. These two verses right away bring a strong urging from Paul to imitate God. He explains the concept with triple usage of word love, agape. It's a summary, summary verses about God's love and Ephesians, in, in my understanding. Because if you look back, in chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, Paul wrote that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we, might, we may be holy and unblemished in his sight and love. Later in chapter 1, Paul stated that Ephesians already possess and use this agape love towards all holy people. Later in chapter 2, Paul taught that we are saved by God who was moved by his great love and expressed his love by making us alive in Christ. In chapter 3, Paul prays for Ephesians to experience the love of Christ that surpasses the knowledge. In chapter 4, Paul expects the believers to return true love into Christ because this, in effect, builds up a believer in love of Christ. All these teachings made Paul to proclaim the Ephesians and all the Christians as beloved children of God. This is our identity. And yes, the reality each one of us lives today may communicate to us the opposite feeling, that we are not loved by God, that maybe you don't feel that you are the child of God. That is where faith is required, to believe what the Word of God says and not what the circumstances or even our interpretations of circumstances tell us. By calling us beloved children, Paul teaches us that we are capable of loving God and walk His ways. It's not because of our strength to love God. It's all because of Jesus. He loves us first. He showed His love on the cross. Is there a need for me to explain today what does God's love is about? I read about one medieval monk who announced that he would be preaching the following Sunday, the following Sunday evening, on the topic, the love of God. As the shadows fell and the light ceased to come in, uh, to come in through the cathedral windows, the congregated gathered. In the darkness of the altar, the monk lighted a candle and carried it to the crucifix. First of all, he il illumined the crown of thorns Next, the two wounded hands. Then, the marks of spear, spear wound. In the hush that fell, he blew out the candle and left the chancel. There was nothing else to say. I'm tempted to finish my sermon here too. But it's so bright, you would notice my departure. Paul teaches Ephesians that we imitate God of love by walking the way of love. Have you seen toddlers learning to walk? How they try to stand up, then they think to make a first step or not to make a first step, then they lose their balance and then they cry because falling hurts. But sometime later they are up again and they want to do it again until they get it. They obtain a skill of keeping the balance and very soon you run after them everywhere. 
God wants us to learn to walk after him, after his character. We usually tend to imitate those people whom we are impressed with. Maybe it's your teacher, maybe it's uh, your friend. But these two verses made me think, am I impressed with God? When was the last time I was amazed with God? What things in God am I subconsciously drawn to imitate? My mom told me a story from my childhood. When I was a toddler, uh, seeing my mom washing the floor in the apartment, I would do the same. I had my own small bucket and my own mop. I would wet the mop and start imitate my mom's moves. Of course, there were puddles of water after me, which my mom had to wipe dry, but this was not of importance to her. Ten years later, when I was a teenager, who was given a daily task of mopping the floor, I would simply, simply imitate the cleaning process by sprinkling water here and there, sweeping the rubbish under the carpet. The natural imitation disappeared somewhere. So God asks us to imitate him. Does Paul ask us to die as Christ did because we've read about his sacrificial love? I would say no and yes. We can't give up our lives for all to be saved. That's Christ's mission. That's only his task. Though we can sacrifice our lives for him voluntarily, choosing to invest our resources, time, energy, emotions, finances, those resources into the lives of others. Or we can imitate him by relating to people with love and grace by washing somebody's feet like Jesus did, literally and figuratively. By participating in the process of sanctification, parting ways with old habits and obtaining the new habits. But the bottom line for Paul is this. Beloved children are to walk in way of love as Jesus loved us. It would be great to stop here. It's just a sermon for itself, just two verses. Enough food for thought. But our passage doesn't stop here. Let us read verses 3 and 4. But among you there must not even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Whoa! We've just spoken about love. How did these descriptions got here? I am amazed like Ben was amazed last week. I am asking the same question. Who is Paul talking here about? Paul has just urged Ephesians to love like Jesus and now switch to a long list of unpleasant things. To say the least, sexual immorality, any kind of impurity, greed, obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking... If Paul see, saw these practices among Ephesians, then he encourages them to grow spiritually, put off their old self, and put on their new identity in Christ. And pastors usually explain this grow, growth in holiness with a four-stage diagram. Stage one, uh, we sin unconsciously. So, like, without knowing God's law, we just, we just do it. That's in our nature. Na nature. Just, just do it. S uh, stage two, we sin consciously. We understand what and why we do, and our will is involved. Stage three, we don't sin consciously. We understand what and why we shouldn't do, and we have an alternative way of action, which pleasing God. And slide four, we don't sin unconsciously. So not sinning becomes our holy behavior, becomes our new nature. We, we do it without even thinking about it. So that's, that's the goal. So stage four is our goal. And we usually spend our life between stages two and three, most of our life. So we experience victories and failures. Uh, and this is one reason we, 
we feel motivated to live like Jesus, but in another season of life, we just discouraged, we are depressed, that we are worthless, like we, we cannot uh, please God and do His will, we give up. But if Paul speaks about, doesn't speak about believers in, in uh, Ephesus church, then he implies that the cultural context which Ephesians are uh, living in may have an impact on them if they don't watch out for it. Sexual impurity, for example, in Greek is a word porneo. It's a broad term which covers all deviations from God's standard. Nowadays, we hear this root word in the word pornography. If Paul warns believers about negative influence of the cultural context, it may mean that these things might not, might not take place in our church. It causes us to study our context in which we live. What does our culture say and practice about sex and sexuality? What does our culture say and practice about what is good and what is bad? What does our culture say and practice about the greed? I have named these collections of characteristics as imitation of love. Without God, we, we people, we tend to love others the way we want to, or we, we, like, like we feel. Without God, we fall into self-gratification. We want more of the material, material possessions. Without God, we do any kind of impurity because we consider ourselves as absolute authority. I decide what is right and what is wrong. Without God, we tend to store earthly treasures for ourselves. We imitate love for ourselves. I think this is what Apostle John called the lust of flesh, lust of eyes, and the pride of life. And we might, we might by mistake, unconsciously, bring this attitude or practices into the church. Remember the, those four stages of sanctification. We as believers might either actively do them or passively laugh about it. So, because uh, Paul, in his, in his words, didn't describe only the uh, active uh, breaking of the law, but he also mentions the, uh, the speech, how we speak about it. This is our second list what uh, uh, is about. We may be able not to fall into those sins, sexual impurity, um, greed, but when we gather, we might cynically joke about them and just make them main topics of our conversations. In the light of the calling to walk like beloved children of God, Paul invites us to do the positive alternative. It makes sense. Being disciple of Jesus means that you stop doing one set of old habits and you start to do a set of new habits. Walking away and walking towards two parts of the equation. You don't just do one, you, you do both. I don't have an answer yet, but this passage made me think. So how can I promote God's view on sex and sexuality? What can I grow in my, how can I grow in my obedience to God's word, considering it as absolute authority for my life? How can I grow in generosity moved by God's love? How can I learn to fill my speech and conversations with uh, conversations with people with gratitude to God for his gifts and actions, gratitude for his miracles, praise for his character. The bottom line which Paul draws here in terms of imitation of love, beloved children are not to practice cultural ways of love which contradict God's word. But Paul doesn't stop here either. He has something else to say. In verses 5 and 6. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Here I see 
limitation of imitation of love by God of love. What a contrast with the first two verses, verse 1 and 2 of chapter 5. God's love there, God's wrath here. Whoa. This passage is a beautiful statement about God of the Bible. God is perfectly loving and he is perfectly just. That's a full po portrait of God. And this doesn't mean that Paul speaks about losing salvation. To explain what Paul means uh, in these two verses, let us turn back to the illustration of a four-stage growth in holiness. The stage where people sin unconsciously and the next stage where people sin deliberately, so stages one and two. Sadly, there can be such people in the church who don't realize why did Jesus come in the first in the, in, in, in the in, in the first place. Why did Jesus had to have to die on the cross? And sadly, there can be people in the church who imitate their Christianity and basically lead a double life. These verses are a sober warning. A person who is actively obedient to Jesus is, in, is under control of the Holy Spirit or a person who is actively disobedient to Jesus and is under control of his own desires. Two kinds of people. Because in the Bible, faith is an active thing. It's not just a knowledge. But what you do out of this faith, uh, you, you live it out. That's what, that's what faith is about. And same true about the concept of sinning. It means to actively live in that. It's not about just breaking God's law once. But you continue over and over doing it. Being disobedient to Jesus can go unnoticed by people. But the day will come when we all would report back to Jesus. As Paul uh, wrote in 1 Corinthians 3, 13 and 17. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Next. Don't you know what, that you yourself are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. And in chapter 4, 4 and 5, Paul continues his thought. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. We are to watch for ourselves. Be responsible, first of all, for our own actions. By speaking about disobedience, Paul returns us to chapter 1 and 2 of the Ephesians. In chapter 2, uh, I, I took New King, uh, New King James Version. And you, made him, and you he made alive, who were dead in the trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. We were sons of disobedience. We were dead, and then God made us alive. If we have experienced such a transformation, why do some believers want to return back? If they were made alive, why do they want to become dead again? God has given a deposit of his inheritance by sealing us with the Holy Spirit. So why would anyone want to lose any part of inheritance in the future? So Paul wants the Ephesians to calculate the consequences and make a proper choice. If someone chooses to imitate love, God would put a limit to that by not allowing into the kingdom of Christ and God. An interesting phrase, the kingdom of Christ and of God, Paul reminds us of a divinity of Christ. 
he is not just a good example to follow in this life. He will be a king. He will be ruling in his kingdom. So the bottom line which Paul draws here, the children of wrath will not enter the kingdom of God love. Wow, such a passage we've read today. We've studied five things which, which belong to God. God's example, God's children, holy people of God, kingdom of Christ and of God, God's wrath. A beautiful motivation for life in Christ. His kingdom is coming and Jesus will fill this kingdom with his people. Here on earth we have a choice to live like sons of disobedience or like children of God. And we have a calling to be holy, separated from sin and separated from, for, for God. Be holy like God is holy because we naturally want to imitate the Father who loves us. So let's go and do so. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for reminding us in your word today about your love, your agape love, unconditional. You have shown your love 2,000 years ago. And we still try to ponder upon it. We still try to understand it. It surpasses our knowledge. It surpasses our understanding. We're still amazed by the greatness of your love. We are amazed that you made us your children through faith, by grace. You made us alive in Christ. Without you, Jesus, we are dead. In you, we are alive. Whatever age we are today, help us to imitate you like small children. Imitate your love, imitate your actions, how you treated people, how you served them. Help us to do the same. Even though we would leave puddles on the floor, even though it won't be that effective or, or great, it doesn't matter. Holy Spirit, in the following week, we pray that you would give us strength to come under the control of the God's word and of you and to have strength in you, Jesus, to be like you. That by the end of the week, we would bring you all the glory to everything you would achieve through us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.